Hi everyone, a very good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you all for tuning in to CBS Kale's Virtual Education Forum with a focus on gastroenterology. Uh, we're very honored to have both Datuk Ganes and Dr. Niu from CBS KL to be giving the talks today. Um, we will start off with Datuk Ganes. Um, Datuk Ganes obtained his MBBS uh, medical degree from UKM and thereafter went on to obtain his fellowships in uh, gastroenterology from UK, um, in London, in Glasgow, in Sendai. He is a highly decorated gastroenterologist. I'm sure everyone who's tuning in would know who he is. Dr. Gades will start off the session by talking about management of functional dyspepsia in a clinical setting. Dato, if you're ready, you can just take it away. Thank you. Hello. Hi. How do I know people can hear me? I'm sure they can, like, no? So I'm going to we carry can on hear you, my, my talk. Okay, my objective will be simple case-based presentation. I'll have a case afterwards. I'm going to introduce you to gastrojodinal functional disorder. I'm going to focus on functional dyspepsia. That's my topic, dyspepsia today. The terms related to functional dyspepsia will be epigastric pain syndrome and prosperial distress syndrome. You'll, you'll listen to these two words very so often until you get... Uh, you start puking listening to them, like, you know. These are two common names, uh, terms, that we use in functional dyspepsia in the current day. Then I'll talk to you a bit of management of functional dyspepsia. Okay, back to basic, uh, SOAP, Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. We all have this. In our practice, we practice this. Subjective means what the patient tells us. The problem with us is sometimes we don't listen to our patient. We need to listen and ask the right questions and we get the right answers. Doctors who don't listen, will have a problem. You're going to get the wrong diagnosis. Doctors who have all the time, the, the, one of the complaints that patients have is doctors do not have time to listen to us. That's what the patient grouses is. So if you listen in and you cue, and you take the cue to the call and you get the right diagnosis. Objective means you assess the patient clinically, you examine the patient, take some um, vital signs and temperature and you get a little bit of an answer as to what's going on. Assessment means we investigate the patient we look and, as, and assess what's in the past to assess the present and we do some tests for the patient. We include blood tests, ultrasound, endoscopy, CT scans, MRIs, urine tests to assess the patient. And then we formulate our plan. So the thing is, you ask the right question, you get the right answers and this will assist you in the management to get a good outcome for your patient. What is dyspepsia? Now, in the room four criteria, so there must be room one, two, three, and now the fourth one. Room is where a group of people got together, gastroenterologists. These are all the functional, functional disorder consultants, gastroenterologists of prominence, got together and then they deliberated elab, uh, on topics of concern. And one of them is functional dyspepsia. Dyspepsia means it's a recurrent upper GI symptom on an average of once weekly. Um, take this off. Um, okay, okay. Uh, in the last three months, with symptoms onset more than six months back, with no abnormality in the diagnostic testing, which includes upper endoscopy, ultrasound, blood tests. And again, there must be no alarm symptoms. This word here, no alarm symptoms, very, very important. In all cases of getting any, any medical condition, especially terms like dyspepsia, if your patient has dyspepsia and you take it lightly, you're gonna have a major problem. If you, if you take dyspepsia as a symptom and you look at the criteria of diagnosis and you've excluded everything and there's no alarm symptoms, well, you are safe margin. Dyspepsia does not carry a negative connotation. Okay, now in the old criteria, the room two criteria, we talked about functional dyspepsia in this order. Reflux-like, ulcer-like, dysmotility-like and non-specific uh, uh, functional dyspepsia. Now, on the side here, you, this reflux will be heartburn and acid regurgitation. Also, like be epigastric pain. This motility will be nausea, bloating, fullness, and early satiety. And non specific do not fulfill any criteria for ulcer or this motility, like, uh, but we term them as dyspepsia. They included heartburn. So, you got any discomfort in the epigastric area, uh, that's the gastrojodinal area, you would term them as uh, reflux like dyspepsia. So they have incorporated uh, reflux into the criteria in Rome 2. Now, in symptoms of dyspepsia, 
uh, where symptoms must be more than uh, for the past three months and the symptom onset must be more than six months ago. That's your criteria of dyspepsia. The terms of endearment will be epigastric pain, epigastric burn, early satiety, and postprandial fullness. Very important. These are the, these are the symptoms of uh, dyspepsia. We also include nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, burping and belching, bloating, heartburn, rumination. Remember, heartburn was included in Roman 2 criteria. And rumination. This is uh, again what the cows do. You can uh, bring out food and you chew, 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 you swallow them again, and then bring them up again. Now, so it looks very vague here. You find it very difficult to address patients when you have so many symptoms. But your most important symptom for dyspepsia will be the first four. Epigastric pain, epigastric burn, early satiety, and postprandial fullness. In Rome 4, that's the latest criteria set up in 2016. Uh, group of people sent in Rome and elaborated on all the functional disorders, which include esophageal disorders, starting with functional chest pain, functional heartburn, reflux hypersensitivity, global functional dyspepsia, uh, dysphagia, gastroduodenal disorder. Functional dyspepsia included in this group of pain in condition, which includes postprandial distress syndrome, remember this term, epigastric pain syndrome, EPS, also the encompasses belching disorders, again, the excessive supragastric belching, excessive gastric belching, nausea and vomiting disorder, chronic nausea, vomiting syndrome, cyclical vomiting syndrome, and it's very interesting, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, read this, some of our patients do have this, quite a number of our students or our young adults take cannabis. Now, rumination syndrome is here. So includes irritable bowel syndrome, which moves from the constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant. I won't go through all this. I'm going to focus, I want to get your focus to gastroduodenal disorder. There's a function dyspepsia, the postprandial distress syndrome, and the epigastric pain syndrome. Of course, there are other function disorders, the centrally mediated disorders of gastrointestinal pain, the gallbladder and sphincter of ordi disorders, anorectal disorders. This is disorders that you excluded structural abnormality and you're left with functional disorder. Now, this is for children. Uh, you've got your own set of functional disorders in children. Again, my topic for today is coning in on gastroduodenal disorders, functional dyspepsia, which includes postprandial distress syndrome and epigastric pain syndrome. Functional disorder, dyspepsia is common and the prevalence in a, in, a, in a population would be about 8 to 15% of the population. And we know just like reflux disease, it impairs quality of life and increases emotional distress in people. We also know that functional gas, gastrointestinal disorders, there's an overlap between functional dys dyspepsia with irritable bowel syndrome and heartburn, acid reflux here. Now, questionnaires are important to elucidate the diagnosis. And we do sometimes give our patients questionnaires something like this. Have you at any time during the past three months been troubled by early satiety? Yes, no. Postprandial fullness, epigastric pain or discomfort, abdominal burn. Now, the postprandial distress syndrome, the PDS, would include the early satiety and the postprandial fullness. In the old criteria, this would be the motility type of disorder. Now, the epigastric pain syndrome would be epigastric pain or discomfort, or epigastric burn and discomfort or pain. Now, EPS would be including something like acid peptic disease minus the peptic ulcer disease and the reflux disease. Functional dyspepsia would be either the PDS here, the postprandial distress syndrome, or includes the epigastric pain syndrome or an overlap within that. So this is a criteria before the Rome 3 criteria, that's Rome 3. In Rome 3, they accept, they do not accept heartburn in their criteria. If you have heartburn, you'll be transferred to reflux disease. You would not be considered in any patient with functional dyspepsia. But in Rome 4, we do include patients with heartburn into functional dyspepsia. So that, that kind of description can be quite difficult. If your patient is intelligent enough to answer that, you can get the diagnosis. Sometimes it's very difficult to conceptually uh, understand the terminology that's been discussed just now. Even I find it very difficult. So uh, Jack Tack from Belgium, he devised pictorial uh, description of this condition. If you look at the first one, he's trying to describe this is where your uh, gastroduodenal area is above the navel. If you look at it carefully, the upper part just below the xiphod will be where the OG junction is. 
And then just below, just above the navel, just slightly above the navel would be the pylorus. And around the navel, we would describe that as where the duodenal area is, or the head of pancreas would be. Now, he put a ton of uh, metal here and he says that this is postprandial fullness. He puts a tight belt here and says that early satiety, you can't expand anymore. Here he says epigastric pain, it's an epigastric burn. This would be an upper abdominal bloating. This would be nausea without the vomiting and this will be vomiting and you're retching away. This is heartburn, burning pain or retrosternal area and this regurgitation. You regurgitate and you bring it back again. Now, he has studied, if you ask, a, if you send a patient questionnaires and pictograms, you can get functional heartburn in right concord, uh, concordance with patients with actual functional heartburn after investigation. So he believes quite pictogram do help in evaluating this patient. These are the pictograms he elucidated to just now. So in other words, postprandial distress syndrome would be postprandial fullness as such. Early satiety or early satiation as in such epigastric pain syndrome, this will be epigastric pain, there will be epigastric burn, not heart burn, but epigastric burn. So now uh, we can classify them and you've got to understand postprandial distress syndrome, this is a motility type disorder. It's worsening of symptoms after meals. You can remember postprandial distress syndrome would be related to after meals. And epigastric pain syndrome are not meal related. You, can't, you get bloating, belching, nausea, vomiting, abdominal discomfort, as your other symptoms. Patients are uncomfortably full after a regular size meal, and it's more than one time a week. And unable to finish a regular size meal, they feel full. And they, are, they have undisturbed sleep pattern because they're not related to sleep and because they don't have any meals during sleep time. Now again, we talk about red flags, and the important thing about red flag is look for unintentional weight loss, GI bleeding like Melina, Ribena-like stools, or hematomyces, dysphagia, volume regurgitation, vomiting, dysphagia, and uh, pal palpable abdominal masses, family of cancers, eye deficiency anemia. You investigate the patient straight away. The case I'm going to describe will be a 21-year-old lady who's an international student uh, was seen in June 2016. She complained of epigastric pain and burn for the past two years. There was no heartburn, but in the epigastric area. Not related to meals, no warning symptoms, frequent ED visits because of epigastric pain. She got a lot of period pains, no recreational drugs. They got asked this in all students nowadays, especially cannabis. Multiple allergies, including NSAIDs and antibiotics and, and methylpropamide. Clinical examination was essentially unremarkable except mild tenderness in the epigastric area. So what is your diagnosis? I'm going to fly through this because this is uh, a closed forum in a way. Now, I would call her, I can't call her non-ulcer dyspepsia because she hadn't had a scope then. She could still be having a peptic ulcer disease. I can call her functional dyspepsia, but remember I've not worked her up. But again, functional dyspepsia sounds like a nice diagnosis for her. Peptic ulcer disease is something to think about. Whether she's got an ulcer sitting in the stomach or in the duodenum. GERD is something to think about. Remember, epigastric pain could be a feature of reflux disease. And when you scope a patient, the predominant theme could be just erosive reflux disease, nothing in the stomach. Epigastric pain syndrome, and that sounds very right. She's got something that sounds like epigastric pain, but she has not been worked out. So what is the test that you would do in your practice? Of course, you tell the, you give advice with regards to lifestyle. You talk to the student. She's an international student. She comes from uh, Tanzania. And uh, you probably talk about lifestyle, what they eat, and how to manage themselves. You probably give the patient some antacid, alginates. You may try the patient on a trial of proton pump inhibitor or H2RA. Now, Zentac has been pulled out of the market. That's ranitidine. But of course, you got famotidine and, and cimatidine in, in, your, in your armamentarium. Of course, you got all the proton pump inhibitors. I always use them in antacid alginates, huh? because that's for salvage or for breakthrough pain. Now, would prokinetic agents be useful here? Example, etopride, 50 milligram try three times a day with antacid alginate. Here, it looks more like this is going to be epigastric pain syndrome. I would, I would rather go for a proton pump inhibitor. Would you try an empirical trial or helicobacter pylori eradication? Empirical trial is wrong. You would test and treat. You would not do an empirical trial. No such thing. Uh, not safe. You've got a side effect of drugs that you've seen from time to time and it can be life-threatening. You are not justified. You need to, you need to uh, investigate, test and, test and treat. Would you refer to a gastroenterologist? 
Yes, that sounds like a very logical thing to do. What test would you perform? H. pylori serology? Yes, there's a thought in your clinic practice. Urea breath test, that's a better test because it tells you it's an antigen testing. It tells you active or not active. H. pylori serology doesn't, does not connote activity. It may just tell you a past history of H. pylori or present history. Artisan endowment to look for gallstones. And OGDS will tell you a lot of things. Useful, but will you scope a patient at this age? A CT abdomen would be useful in a right setting, not in this lady. She was referred to her. That's how I saw her. She was referred by the general practitioner because she didn't do well with medication. So she came for a scope on the 6th of June, 2016. This is the, this is the lower end of the esophagus. You can see the Z line. The Z line is intact. There's a bit of redness at the site here. So she would have something I would term as an M pattern, non-erosive reflux disease. You look at the upper part of the stomach. This is, sphinct, this is, a, this is a scope and we are doing a retroflexion. The internal sphincter actually can close very well. And the external sphincter here made by the diaphragm, this is a ret retroflexion, is closing very well. Now you look at the uh, mucosa of the stomach, you see submucosal erythema. This is a very classical feature of Helicobacter pylori. If you look at the bottom here, this is actually in the incisura, you can see erythema with areas of atrophy. It's a classical feature of Helicobacter pylori. This is a duodenum and I can see the, 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 the papilla here and the papilla looks normal. So this lady has Helicobacter pylori positive on the rapid urease test. That's a quick test that we do. We take, a, to, uh, we take two or three or four biopsies of the mucosa and put it in this container that uh, is the rapid urease uh, test and we see whether the test is positive and the test was positive. She went for Helicobacter pylori eradication for two weeks. She went for the HP7 as uh, uh, the utility of uh, pentaprozole, claritromycin, and moxicillin. He tol uh, tolerated it very well. The urea breath test after two months was negative and she'd been symptom free for one year. Occasionally, she sees a gynecologist for period pain, otherwise, she's fairly well. Unfortunately, after close to two years, she reappeared, telling us that she was unwell for the past eight months. She had upper abdominal fullness after meals with nausea, vomiting, and bloating. So she was very well for at least, or at least a year uh, after H. pylori eradication, hardly saw the gastroenterologist. There was no weight loss. Remember, an ultrasound done earlier did not show any uh, gallstones. She had trouble coping with the studies and she was very stressed out in all the assignments. Uh, she passed motion three, uh, two to three, two to seven days once. She's a bit constipated. Now, the diagnosis of postprandial distress syndrome was made and would you subject to a repeat scope? And the answer was no, we did not scope her. How do we treat her? Well, we counseled her, talked to her about the exams that was on the, the, in the corner, and we counseled her, we talked to her. We did give her a prokinetic agent, that's etopride, with a bit of an uh, anti-wind, that's symeticone. We did give her some, uh, at that time it was dysplatyl, which she takes four times a day whenever she needs, with a bit of methylspasmal. She did very well with it. Huh? The symptoms improved and she went on to finish her course. Now with all these questionnaires and pictograms, a patient can come to you and point to the certain site and mark in the abdomen something like this. This is an amoeba scale, uh, a self-completing questionnaire that tells the, the doctor or the attending uh, medical health professional, this is where the symptom is. From this kind of charts and this kind of questionnaires and they tell you about duration or what treatment has been done, we can develop a program and you can give us a fairly good diagnosis based on very intelligent, uh, I, uh, uh, intelligent software that can give us diagnosis and offer treatment. It can also include all the tests that you have and they'll be fairly useful. Now, dyspepsia based on the Rome 2 and Rome three criteria, dyspepsia will mean symptoms through, that originates from the gastroduodenum area as we alluded to earlier. And for uninvestigated dyspepsia, we classify them, all the patients with dyspepsia, we, we work them up and you find that 70% of your patients, a good majority will have functional dyspepsia with nothing else. And about 30% will end up with an organic dyspepsia, I mean, peptic ulcer disease, GERD, or some form of malignancy, which is not very common, provided you've looked at the red flags. But again, this is all the tests that have been done, endoscopy, blood tests, ultrasound, CT scan. So in a, in a GP practice, you're quite safe, not 100% safe, maybe 70% safe for you to make a diagnosis of functional dyspepsia and get away with it. 
provided there's no red flag, huh? no red flag. Then again, when you diagnose functional dyspepsia, you're going to look into whether it's a postprandial distress syndrome, which is meal-related or epigastric pain syndrome, which is meal-unrelated. Again, the terms of endearment would be early satiation, postprandial fullness in the, in the meal-unrelated functional dyspepsia, as the epigastric pain syndrome would be epigastric pain or epigastric burn. Now, there are three, three groups actually, postprandial distress syndrome, epigastric pain syndrome, and overlap between postprandial distress syndrome, epigastric pain syndrome. As a third kind, this is not a, this is also a big group of patients. Now, your differential diagnosis for functional dyspepsia encompasses all this and a lot more. Look and think about all the differential diagnosis when you're clocking your patient. If you think that something's amiss, you would send the patient for investigation or you would investigate the patient. It, it flies from something called peptic ulcer disease, reflux, helicobacter pyrrhal related infection and their related diseases, your lactose intolerance, your polylithiasis, polycystitis, drug induced dyspepsia, uh, upper GI malignancy, uh, parasitic infection, coronary artery disease, obstruction to hepatobiliary tract, maybe a stone, a stricture, hypercalcemia, or just abdominal wall pain. Now, you also got the recognition of the fact that you must get a good drug history, but certain drugs gives you dyspepsia. This include all this that I alluded to here. Don't worry, you get a copy of this slide. If you ask Brenda nicely, she'll send it to you after I vetted it. I'll give you something later on. Now, dyspepsia in a country survey can be uh, postprandial distress syndrome, epigastric pain syndrome, or overlap. And this is uh, in, in epidemic surveys. Huh? Okay, now, these are the pathophysiology that uh, comes along with it, and I'm going to discuss. You see it in your notes later. Uh, again, uh, repeating this many, many a times, I want you to understand room four criteria. Epic functional dyspepsia would be epigastric pain syndrome, postprandial distress syndrome, or a mix between the two. Make sure there is no uh, organic cause to it. What's the treatment for functional dyspepsia? Okay, the first thing I tell my patients is reassurance. I got to educate them, tell them what's going on, lifestyle, dietary recommendation, I tell them what to do, and also avoidance of certain things that make it worse, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, traditional complementary medicine, uh, coffee, alcohol, the works. Huh? You tell them about lifestyle. Lifestyle is very important. Now, algorithm of care would be something like this. If I got a patient, there's an old algorithm. This is 2012. Huh? This is the Asia-Pacific a primary care setting uh, algorithm for uninvestigated dyspepsia. If you've got alarm symptoms, there's no question about it, you will send the patient for workup investigation, which most of the time includes an upper endoscopy, which will include a CT or an ultrasound or further other tests. Now, if you have no alarm symptoms, then you can do an empirical trial or PPI, or we can do a test and treat this patient if they are, if they are H. pylori positive. It takes away a big group of patients who's got organic problems that need to be treated. Again, uh, response to PPI is good in this group of patients. Now, um, you, if you fail this, then you will investigate the patient looking for organic cause. And again, if there's nothing happens to the patient, then it goes back to this group called functional dyspepsia. Again, even then in, in, in 2012, people looked at functional dyspepsia as epigastric pain or burning and a postprandial fullness Early satiation, this was based on Rome 3 criteria at the time. The treatment for epigastric pain and burn will be a proton pump inhibitor with or without a prokinetic agent. Here in your postprandial fullness, a meal related will be a prokinetic agent with or without a proton pump inhibitor. Now, if you fail all this, then you may want to try antidepressant or you refer the patient to a specialist if you are willing to take uh, chances here with your patient, provided, take the chance, provided you have no red flags. That's very, very important. So this is an old interview given by a previous prime minister. And he said, eat slowly, which, can, which sounds very good. Eat until you're just satisfied. Don't eat until you're full. That takes care of your postprandial fullness. And if you like it, don't eat it because some of the food stuff that you take aggravates uh, this condition. Your tools of therapy would be H. pyrrhal eradication, acid suppression can be H2RA, proton pump inhibitors. Again, motility agents, that's prokinetic agents. Etopride being the name number one that I have in my armamentarium. Uh, Maxalon, I don't use very much because it's got a lot of side effects. Uh, Domperidone, I'm very careful with it. I don't use it any more than two weeks because of the reported higher incidence of QT prolongation and also a uh, little bit of extra side effects. Cisopride is not available. This was my favorite drug in the past. Very good drug. Pulled out because of a uh, slight increase in the QT prolongation and sudden death. Semitico is useful for those who have wind-related or meteospasmal. 
because of protecting agents, you can use them. It's not, I don't use them very much. So function dyspepsia, the treatment option would be H5 eradication, acid suppression, prophetic agent, uh, centrally acting drugs in here would be your antidepressant, you may. Now the new approaches coming, placebo is useful. Uh, other treatments like uh, uh, probiotics pro, uh, and et cetera would be useful for a lot of people. Placebo works in a good big group of people and uh, there are placebo reactors now mix. Function dyspepsia, the therapeutic gain uh, over placebo with PPI is 7 to 10%, H2RA is about 7 to 35%. Your h 5 r patient the therapeutic gain about, about uh, 6 to 12, 14%. Again, talking about anti, uh, TCAs, uh, tricyclic antidepressants. In America, they don't have too much uh, prokinetic agent, so they rely a lot on their PPI and also their h 5 r eradication. Again, uh, uh, meta analysis tells us that. Uh, uh, response to h power eradication in a selected group of people uh, are good. You need to eradicate h power You must eradicate with tests for them, and the therapeutic gain is uh, uh, of benefit. PPI um, in function dyspepsia is very useful. Uh, the, the number to treat that you need to get uh, an outcome would be about 10, that's a large number, but again, it's a useful strategy for management of patients in your epigastric burn, epigastric pain syndrome. Again, uh, Strategies, if you fail the PPI in the group of patients, you are first, first thing you want to ask, just like reflux disease, is compliance. You must check compliance. Are the patients compliant to your therapy? Most people are not compliant. We know that from uh, the treatment of uh, reflux disease. You may have to modify the, the PPI, change PPI, or double the dose. If you look carefully, the prokinetic role in functional dyspepsia, the American uh, Gastroenterological Association guidelines mark it as third line because they don't have Ganathon or Ethopride in their setting. They don't have much prokinetic agents. But in the European setting, they, they mark it very high. Rome 4 is a balanced thing between Europe and Asia and also America. They mark it as first line in function dyspepsia with postprandial distress subtype. And they mark it as first line, distraught patient. And Ethopride is the one drug that, that seemed to do very well in distraught patient. See, the prime has been withdrawn. Huh? That was a sad thing indeed. Now, there are some studies, you can go through these studies in your notes later. The number of treat when uh, Cisapride was in this study, in this meta-analysis, the number of treat was seven. That was quite a good study. But again, uh, as far as prokinetic is concerned, Cisapride has been withdrawn. You're left with etoprine at the moment in time. Cupboard is nearly empty. Now, prokinetic agent was placebo. If Cisapride was removed, the number of needle treat goes up to 12. And the one drug that stands out is actually uh, prepulsive. Okay, as I alluded to, uh, QT prolongation is something that we take seriously. And uh, we've got to be very careful with uh, motilium or damperidone. I wouldn't use it for a prolonged period of time. I wouldn't use it for people with cardiac problems. Be careful in elderly patients. Etoprite seems to be safe with no QT prolongation. And I think it's a safe drug. Again, the study can read it later. What is etoprite? Is a novel prokinetic agent that works by antagonizing dopamine D2 receptors and inhibiting acetyl cholinesterase and has been shown to improve postprandial fullness and early satiety with a low rate of adverse reaction. The dose is 50 milligrams taken before meals. I tell my patient to take it 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes before meals and I give them for a duration of two weeks to about uh, four weeks, sometimes even up to eight weeks in the group of patients. This drug is not available in the US, so they don't have much experience with it. The Hallmark paper came with uh, Gerald Holtman in Adelaide when he did uh, the Hall Hallmark paper. He was trying to get uh, the, the dose off uh, for ethoprine in, in, in patients with functional dyspepsia. And his number to treat was six for ethoprine, and that was very impressive as compared to proton pump inhibitors uh, in selected group of patients. Uh, these are the function dyspeptic patients. Uh. Now, this is a comparison of different types of prokinetic agent. agent. Ganathon stands uh, uh, firm as uh, the leader here, uh, dual mode of action, uh, and good antiemetic action, uh, no drug drug interaction, uh, no cardiac side effects at the moment in time, not been described. Uh, potential to cause elect, uh, extra, uh, uh, extra pyramidal side effects are minimal. Potential to cause uh, hypoparathema minimal. It doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So this is my, fav my, my favorite uh, prokinetic agent. Again, a meta-analysis, you can read this. This is by Huang in the World Journal of Gastroenterology. And they allude to it, it improving the, the GPA score of functional dyspeptic patients 
are more than domperidone, the other prokinetic agent, helps with postprandial fullness and early satiety. This drug is a fairly decent drug. No? Okay. Now, contraindication, you must know each other very well. Who do you not use to? Don't use this drug. Just like Kripal said, maybe we used it. Now, surprise, we use it wrongly. We use it for patients that we're not supposed to use it. So the drug got withdrawn. Older patients, people with cardiac disease, prolonged QT interval, and it was withdrawn. That was a very good drug. No? If you don't overdose your patient, Nothing happens, but because the doses were too high, use it for a wrong group of patients, we had a problem. So etopride, do not abuse etopride. Etopride is a fantastic drug. Don't use it for people who are sensitive to etopride. That is, uh, people who are, who are allergic or who get reaction to it, anathon. Not many people have problems with anathon, but again, I've got selected group of people who cannot take anathon. I mark them as a sensitive, sensitive or allergic to it. I do not use them. Very few, far and large. Should not be used in patients where there's an increased motility. And this can be dangerous in gastrointestinal hemorrhage, mechanical obstruction, or perforation. Don't use for them. Uh, I would not use uh, for pregnant patients and anyone less than 16 years of age. Now, again, in Rome 4 criteria, back to our final discussion would be what to do with this patient. Get a good history and then ask for alarm features. Again, the same rule applies for any gastrointestinal symptoms. Ask for alarm features. If your alarm symptoms are present, then you investigate this problem, but you must investigate them. Look for another cause of dyspepsia, secondary cause, not a primary cause of dyspepsia, secondary cause, as we alluded to earlier, one whole list of them earlier. Now, you could do, uh, you know, uh, an algorithm of care like this, and you've got uninvestigated dyspepsia. You want to probably consider uh, test and tra treat this patient that's uh, using uh, treatment for H. pylori or your proton pump inhibitor and see what happens to this patient. Or you classify them into uh, this group. You classify them into postprandial distress syndrome and epigastric pain syndrome. If you have postprandial distress syndrome, use a prokinetic agent. If you have epigastric pain syndrome, use an anticyclic drug like H2RAs. Don't use that as there anything at the moment because it's been withdrawn, use H2RAs or a good PPI in the group of patient. And again, follow up this patient and see adequate response. You must watch your patient and see response to therapy. Now, if they fail therapy, you may want to consider and say, look, after investigation, these guys may need something else. They may need antidepressant or they may have to look for other causes like delayed gastric emptying, increased funding tone, hypersensitivity, and something called, something very woke now is durinal mucosa, uh, mucosa inflammation and permeability, and it may have to be investigated. Okay, now, in, in conclusion, uh, postprandial distress syndrome, epigastric pain syndrome, they're treated differently here for kind of agent with or without an acid suppressant. Here would be an acid suppressant with or without a prokinetic agent. We can do a switch after that, you fail therapy. You fail then, you'll look for another cause of it. Huh? So, functional dyspepsia, as far as we are concerned in this era, there's a lot that we need to learn. There are a diverse group of diseases, just like irritable bowel syndrome. A lot to be learned. Newer drugs are on the horizon. And, I, and I'm impressed with this cannabis and cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoids huh? that may come out later, a specific receptor to cannabis. A lot of our kids are on cannabis. And maybe the cannabis itself helps these kids. You know, we need to understand the set group of people who help them. A lot of them actually cause a lot of harm. I wouldn't put my patients on cannabis. Huh? With that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dato, for the insightful talk. Um, for those who just joined us, thank you all for tuning in to a virtual education forum organized by CBSKL. We have Dato Ganes and Dr. New today. Please do submit your questions uh, in the chat function. Um, Dato, we have a few questions for you, if you can just hang on for a while. Some of the attendees are asking, yes. can I prescribe Ganaton together with the PPI? Yes, you can. Uh, my, my care is, I, my, in my practice, um, we, before investigation, after investigation, before investigation, I make sure I understand there's no risk factors, no red flags. I actually classify them into the two main groups. I like to know whether they are the epigastric pain syndrome or postprandial distress syndrome. And then I, I like to see which is which. Huh? Um, I can't move my slides, yeah, okay, okay, so I'm going to go up, go up, okay, I'm going to go up, and I'm going to go up, I'm going to get this slide out, and uh, how do I, put this in? okay, good, 
Now, postnatal distress syndrome. Now, in this group of people, my emphasis is prokinetic agent. In this group of people, my, my emphasis would be uh, PPRI syndrome. If you are H5 positive, I eradicate H5. Right? Now, I can put a prokinetic together with a PPR here, and I can do that too. And a lot of us do that. In the first setting, we give them a PPI and a prokinetic agent. My, my, um, your choice of your PPI, be it original or be it generic, and I normally include in my practice uh, etopride. That'd be my prokinetic agent together with gaviscon and sometimes antacid, and, uh, antacid together with the alginate. I do that, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Datuk. Uh, our next question. For post-GI operated patients who have functional dyspepsia or GI dysmotility, when can I prescribe Ganaton? Okay, now after surgery, I'll be very careful in prescribing any prokinetic agent and, and unless the surgeon agrees to it. Now. So normally in, in, in the hospital, uh, take care of the surgery first and uh, allow them to settle down first. Now, there are a group of people who go for you know, bowel unrelated surgeries. You can, you're okay, say a breast uh, uh, surgery or even a lymph node uh, resection. Or you can start, back, start them back on your prokinetic agent because they're unrelated. If they are bowel related and they have something to do with obstruction or bleed, I'll wait for a while before I start them on prokinetic agent because this prokinetic agent, you look at the uh, product insert, one of the things about uh, uh, etopride would be uh, these conditions are contraindication for this product. Now, there are times where doctors like us are a bit naughty when you have someone got ileus and we start them on both kinetic agents. Well, select your patients and some of the patients do actually do respond to prokinetic agent. Sometimes it's just a matter of time and correcting the underlying uh, electrolyte disorder and underlying disorder before they start moving their bowels. So I'll be very careful in bowel-related disorders, starting them very early. Uh, if they come back to your clinic, they're walking to your clinic, well, you can start them back. I think there, there won't be any problems with your patient. Okay, thank you, Datuk. Uh, one last question before we move on to the next talk. Can Ganaton be used for long term and can I continue prescribing Ganaton after two months? Okay, good, good question. Now, there are patients who go, go on with long term PPIs and long term prokinetic agent. Now, if I've got a patient with a function dyspepsia and the function dyspepsia persists and persists and persists, I, I, I tend to worry about this patient for a few reasons. Number one, if my diagnosis is correct or not, most of the function dyspepsia, they wax and wane. They get better, they get worse. They are, they, they, they are, some of them are meal-related. Those who respond to uh, prokinetic agent tend to be meal-related. These are the uh, epigastric, dis, uh, they, these are the, 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 the postprandial distress syndrome patient. Now, a lot of them, I will moderate diet and I'll treat them. I'll give them Ganaton, as you rightly pointed out, uh, two weeks to eight weeks in this group patient. If I need longer, I'll worry about one problem with uh, most of the prokinetic agents that we saw in the past, something called tachyphylaxis. You keep on using them, the patient will develop a tolerance to this drug and they won't be effective anymore. So I would be very cautious in using more than a set period of time. My, my threshold would be two to four weeks. There are certain patients I go up to eight weeks. Now I stop the drug, I tell them to give them a, a, a holiday and take it intermittently. Again, the same thing with PPI. I give them a holiday and I don't use it long term. Do not abuse this drug by using it long term because if something happens to the patient along the way, your drug will get a bad name line. You know? And then just like Cisapride, it may get withdrawn and I've got no more. Uh, my cupboard becomes truly empty then. Huh? I'll be worried. Yeah? Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Yato. Uh, a quick reminder to all our attendees, please do submit your questions through the Q&A function and um, the doctors, doctors will, will reply to them. Let's move on to the next talk. Um, Dr. Niu Chai Soon graduated from UKM, obtained his MD from UKM and went on to obtain his MRCK, uh, MRCP in the UK. He is a fellow of UKM, Singapore GH and Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan. And he will be speaking about management of H. pylori what do the guidelines say? Talk to you whenever you're ready.
Dr. New, we can't hear you. To all our attendees tuning in, we have a slight technical problem. Please do stay tuned as we fix it on our end.
Hello, I'm um, sorry. Sorry for the delay. So I'm going to start my presentation. So today the topic is about enhancing treatment for helicobacter pylori. So first of all, I'll begin with, with the uh, epidemiology of helicobacter in Malaysia. So Okay, all right. So, um, today we're going to first of all, we're going to talk about the um, H. pylori epidemiology of H. pylori in Malaysia. So, typically, about the H. pylori is the typical acquired during the childhood. But uh, however, the asset uh, means of acquisition by by fecal oral route and other is uh, also can be transferred to contaminations of uh, water. But this better for acquiring this infection issue most of the time is due to a uh, uh, low social economy status. If you have an increasing number of siblings, then your risk of uh, getting this disease is higher. And besides that, a lot of studies also shows that if the mother is also affected by the H. pylori. The incidence of H. pylori also is higher. And besides that, a lot of the uh, especially abroad also shows that uh, men are slightly more likely to be infected uh, compared to female. So how about the epidemiology of H. pylori in Malaysia? So if you can see the graph here, for the past uh, 20 years, actually the incidence of helicobacter pylori in Malaysia has been reducing already. Okay. And we can see that back in the early 90s, um, the incidence of H. pylori is around 51%, and then the prevalence already dropped until uh, 11% uh, in the uh, late uh, 2010. How about the racial compositions of hydrogen better pylori among the Malaysian races? So if we look into the uh, races in Malaysia, Malaysia, Chinese, and Indian, actually you know that, that uh, Indian is still have the highest uh, prevalence among all the three races. And this is followed by the Chinese, which is around 10% at the moment, and Malaysia, uh, Malaysia which is around 5.6%. Uh, so now we have moved in the uh, 2020 already. So in this current uh, age, who is the one that we should be testing? So if we talk about which patient to test, it's all patients with fatty ulcer diseases, or any patient with a history of a fatty ulcer disease. And um, any patient with nearly diagnosed uh, mild lymphoma should also be tested for helicobacter. And besides that, if the patient had a previous uh, history of uh, endoscopic resection or any history of resection for gastric cancer or early gastric cancer, these are the group of the patients should also be investigated. And other patients that need to be in, in, uh, investigated in our uh, clinic setting actually if those are patients who come to us with dyspepsia. And for those patients who come with uh, dyspepsia at the age of younger than 60 years old, we should be using the non-invasive uh, testing like urea breath test. And for those patients uh, who underwent um, endoscopy procedures, uh, we may uh, use the uh, gastric biopsy by, by using the claw test or histological examination. Other groups of patients that we need to investigate for helicobacter are those patients who require long-term antiplatelet therapy or those patients that require long-term usage of painkiller. Any patient who has uh, unexplained uh, iron deficiency anemia or any adult with, uh, with ITP should also be investigated.
sorry for technical error because I'm not using my own my, my, my own PC. And in terms of uh, testing for helicobacter, actually there's no evidence of routine tests or and treat for those patients who are asymptomatic patients with family history of gastric cancer, or any patient with hyperplastic polyps, or lymphocytic gastritis, or patient with a hyperemesis gravidarin. I think the other one of the clinical questions that we always ask in the clinical setting is uh, do we need to treat the patient only or to treat the whole family member? So we know that as I mentioned earlier on that if the patient's um, if, um, if someone in the family is infected, especially an uh, infected mother, so the likelihood of children of, of this infected mother is having this disease also is higher. So there is some study that look at uh, um, that treating the mother as well. So we can understand that, like, especially in Japan's populations, there is a predominance of a mother to child transmission of the disease. So in the patient, um, if you have a female patient who's in the childbearing age, who has helicobacter infections, you may need to consider um, asking about to test, test and treat the, fa the other family members as well because the likelihood of getting the infection is higher. And in terms of testing for helicobacter pylori, and we need to know, understand which test to use. There's a two types of testing for helicobacter pylori. The first one actually is the non-invasive testing, which is the usage of a, of a urea breath test. And the other test that is commonly used, especially in the clinic setting, are the antibody detection test, which is using the serology. However, the problem with the use of serology test actually is have a very poor uh, positive predictive value and, and the specificity towards the active high priority infection also is very low. And the problem with the use of a serology testing actually does not differentiate past infections and current infections. And besides that, serology test actually is not um, good to be used to monitor response to therapy. The better use, uh, the better test to use to test for helicobacter pylori in your clinic setting actually by right should be used in using the urea breath test. And for invasive testing, so what are the tests that we commonly use as a gastroenterologist? Um, the invasive test that we use in our clinical setting actually is the rapid urea uh, test. Uh, which is the commonly uh, the breath test. And the other test we use actually is a histopathology, which is uh, during the endoscopy procedure, we will inquire some sample for testing. And the American guideline has been, um, have given a lot of talk about which test to use already. If you want to diagnose uh, helicobacter correctly, you have to use a breath test or stool antigen test. However, you know that, I mean, we do know that the stool test actually is not commonly available and the patient also may not, uh, may not be comfortable to use these, uh, to collect their stool. So breath test is the one that we should be using in our day-to-day -day clinic practices. So if you ask me, when do I use serology tests? Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the serology test is not a good test, but there is one study that looked into the use of serology testing in the patient who presented with uh, upper GI bleeding. Um, I normally use a, a serology test only, only when the patient presented to, to us with upper GI bleeding because during the upper GI bleeding as, uh, episodes, the, um, the blood itself is a bactericidal. So in terms of taking biopsy also may pose a certain risk to the patient because of worry concern about, um, un, about uh, causing bleeding to the patient. So in this sort of a clinical scenario, I may use serology testing just to confirm whether the patient have uh, antibody towards uh, helicobacter. If the patient has antibody positivity towards uh, helicobacter in upper GI bleeding, I may consider to, to treat this patient rather than proceed, waiting to proceed with the urea breath test. So the conclusion on the, on the testing for helicobacter pylori is always use a breath test to diagnose and to monitor response. Um, the problem with serology is always that it's not able to detect uh, ongoing infections. So in terms of after diagnosing, then we need to ask about treatment of helicobacter. So how to make our treatment better? So first of all, we need to understand what are the factors are influencing the eradication rate. So first of all, we need to, um, we, I mean, antibody is the thing that we commonly use. So we need to understand our local data regarding in terms of uh, resistance towards uh, antibiotics. And um, these are the, some gene mutations in the bacteria that predispose them to have a uh, more resistance towards the various antibiotic use. 
acid, acid uh, suppression also is very important because if uh, insufficient acid inhibition actually can lead to failure of uh, treatment. And this is uh, the sound of the genetic profiling of the patient who has uh, uh, all these sort of uh, genetic profile, which may predispose, uh, predispose them to be a uh, highly metabolizer for the, for the proton pump inhibitor and making the treatment fail. And besides that, the time or durations of the dosing is very important as well. Later, we're going to talk about it. And besides that, the dosage used to eradicate this bacteria also is very important. And talking about the bacteria itself, um, the phenotype of the bacteria also is very important. We do know that a uh, patient who has, um, who has a CAGA status negative or Duke A status uh, negative have a, a, a plural uh, response towards the treatment. How about the patient itself? If the patient is not compliant with the treatment or the who, patient who smoke a lot, also will render the treatment to be failed. First of all, we're going to start about uh, anti-suppression first. Why acid suppression is very important? Because if you look into this graph, basically looking at the concentrations of the various antibiotics in the various pH status, if we we can see that if the patient has a pH of more than uh, four, um, actually their response uh, towards um, uh, the concentrations of the of the of the anti uh, of the antibody actually is better. These are the uh, blood sample from the uh, of, no, sorry. This is the gastric pH uh, gastric uh, sample for from taken from these patients. If we notice that those patients who has a pH of nearly approaching seven actually their concentrations of antibiotic actually is higher. So, and the level of acid does, uh, does affect the stability of the, of the antibiotics. And besides that, the PPI itself actually also have uh, anti h pylori activities. So the effects is, can be either indirect or direct effects. So now we talk about uh, antibiotic resistance. So we need to understand the antibiotic resistance rate in Malaysia. So commonly antibiotic that we use actually is a creatromycin and amoxicillin. Actually, if you look into this chart here, we can notice that actually the antibiotic resistance for creatromycin and amoxicillin actually is still considered, still considered actually is quite good. And um, I know that, I mean, there is some international uh, guidelines that use uh, mitronitazole. Actually, you can look here that actually the local resistance rate of mitronidazole actually is not that great. So mitronidazole actually should not be used in the uh, treatment for helicobacter in Malaysia. Um, this slide basically just shows us various uh, antibiotic regimen that we use to treat uh, helicobacter pylori. So in terms of treatment of uh, H. pylori, so we need to know is uh, First, about the local susceptibility data testing available. So we know that our antibiotic, creatromycin and amosocilin actually is still appropriate in Malaysia. So um, if you look into the guideline coming from America or guideline coming from the UK, actually nowadays they propose a 14 days uh, trip, uh, therapy by using some of them, uh, sorry, they are using quadruple therapy by usage of metronidazole, but in our local setting, metronidazole should not be used. And duration of treatment. Duration of treatment actually is very important as well. Um, if you look into the one of the local studies that look into treatment of a helicobacter in terms of seven days therapy and 14 days therapy, we can notice that actually in terms of intention to treat or per protocol analysis, if we use a 14 days duration, it will really tremendously improve our helicobacter eradication uh, up to 91%. So the take home message is always treat for two weeks. We do not, we should not be treating uh, ranges from seven to 10 days. And what is the first line that we should be using in Malaysia? Um, talking about the usage of first line, we always need to ask about whether there's any presence of, uh, anti of uh, allergies towards uh, penicillin. Uh, because amoxicillin actually is the backbone in terms of treatment for helicopter. And besides that, some other questions that we need to ask a patient is uh, whether there's any previous uh, macrolide exposure or any previous issues of uh, any antibiotics. And this is very important. And based on these two questions, then we'll decide on uh, which regimens that we should be using. So the other question about 
first line treatment for Helicobacter pylori. Nowadays, we know that there is a Bonaprazan or PCAT, uh, which is available already. And we know that if we can improve the pH beyond a six, actually it will make the eradication rate higher. So there is one meta-analysis that look into the usage of PCAT and in comparison towards PPI. And we've noticed that actually the successive rate in terms of eradication of uh, Helicobacter pylori by using the PCAT, actually it ranges around 62, 63% to 98% compared to PPI. Actually, the successive rate also ranges like 40 to 97%. Actually, in terms of uh, various uh, eradication rate, since that, I mean, there's not much of different. So the always question is uh, whether switching to PCAT for better eradication. So in terms of my clinical practice, um, I, usually, I usually use a PCAT as second line. If the patient has failed their first line by using the PPI, sometimes I'll just switch to uh, using of PCAT. The only problem with the usage of PCAT is the cost. And this slide basically shows that the use of um, two different regimes. The A actually is the uh, PPI regimen in treating uh, helicobacter pylori. And the, sec and, the, and the diagram B actually shows the treatment of uh, helicobacter pylori by using the uh, PCAT. And actually, if to conclude, actually the factors are really predicting the successful eradication actually is the appropriate regimen, patient adherence, and the sensitivity. So in terms of sensitivity towards Helicobacter pylori, I think for local setting, the amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and the PPI or PCAT is still the best therapy for local eradications. And now we talk about salvage therapy. Um, if you're talking about salvage therapy, actually adding bismuth is very important. However, we do understand that the bismuth is not, uh, not commonly available. And there is uh, this slide actually shows that if you use the add on uh, PCAT to a conventional regime, I mean, for those patients who have a resistance towards creatromycin, actually it will tremendously also improve the eradication rate for the helicobacter eradications. Um, and the key principle if you want to use salvage therapy is to avoid the antibiotic that has already been given. Um, you can use it, uh, the business quadruple therapy. Um, or the label for fasting based uh, treatment to eradicate the helicobacter pylori. But in terms of local treatment, um, the conventional bismuth quadruple therapy may not be that appropriate because uh, conventional treatment actually includes uh, metronidazole as, as a part of the regimen. Basically, this slide just shows the selections of the various regimen in terms of based on the patient's uh, uh, allergy towards uh, penicillin. And this is actually a slide coming from the American College of Gastroenterology, looking into various salvage therapy for helicobacter eradications. What other things are about how to improve the treatment uh, in helicobacter pylori? I think the other common question that people always ask is about a probiotic, the usage of probiotic. Um, there is some evidence that shows that lactobacillus or bifidobacter actually can have some in inhibitory effects towards uh, H. pylori. And the usage of H. pylori, uh, sorry, the usage of probiotic also may help in terms of reducing the side effect of eradication therapy. Because uh, we do commonly have a lot of complaints from the patients that when they use helicobacter pylori treatment, they develop a lot of side effects such as uh, bloating or abdominal discomfort. And talking about the other questions about uh, helicobacter pylori is the, whether the need of uh, penicillin allergy testing. Um, just for one, uh, one case scenario, I do have one patient previously allegedly, he mentioned to me that he has uh, possible penicillin allergies. However, in this patient, um, later we found out that actually the penicillin allergy actually is not true. Uh, we tried with the patient with a test dose of penicillin, uh, which is amoxicillin, but, and he did fail to develop any side effects or any allergic reactions. And subsequently, this patient was given um, one gram of uh, amoxicillin for uh, TDS as a treatment for his uh, helicobacter eradications. So summary in terms of treatment, um, H. pylori issue is a common worldwide infection. It's a very important cause of petty ulcer disease and gastric ulcers. And tests on treatments is always available. 
And we always need to uh, know our uh, local antibiotic resistant profiling so that we can, we can use a better treatment regime for the patients. Um, if you use uh, salvage therapy to treat Helicobacter pylori, always try to avoid antibiotic that has already used before. And always remember that you have to confirm your eradication after treating the patients. And when we talk about conclusion on treatment, always use the combinations of drugs and always try to maximize your acid inhibition, which is use a double dose PPI and always treat for two weeks. And do not, when you're talking about the use of surface therapy, do not repeat the same antibiotic. And Bismuth salt is always very important in the salvage therapy regime. And if your current treatment uh, work consistently, I mean, for me, my treatment is always amoxicillin and clarithromycin with PPI, and I'm still sticking to this uh, treatment regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Neil, for the insightful talk. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for, for your attention. Um, the first one, is there a need to continue PPI after eradication therapy? Um, actually, I would say that depends on the patient's symptoms. If the patient has very severe symptoms, sometimes I will just uh, continue after the two weeks of eradication, I will continue the PPI for another two weeks. Then after that, I will ask the patient to wait for around a month uh, because we, I mean, if you're using your antibiotic, we know that we need to, we can only repeat the urea back test like a month after the last antibiotic dose. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question. In your opinion and personal experience, how do you compare H. pylori combo pack triple therapy versus loose pack? Um, I think it's just more of the price. Um, Right, uh, because if you look into the combo pack, I mean, from Abbott, actually it's all use uh, original drugs. Um, in my previous government practice, I do use a uh, loose pack before, meaning because uh, most of the government uh, treatments, government regimen is all generic. Actually, it does have an uh, equal, equal successful rate, but there's always a bug on everything. So just uh, sharing one experience. I have one patient who has uh, who presented to us back in, uh, in the days uh, when I was in HUKM, this patient has a recurrent episodes of uh, upper GI bleeding. And this patient also has a persistent non-healing ulcer, which we already proved that it's not malignancy related. And the problem is this patient is, um, despite using the, all these generic medications, the helicobacter is still failed to be eradicated. Um, eventually, we managed to persuade the patient to go for a, a original drug usage, original PPI, original antibiotics, and we managed to, to cure the to cure the infections. So some thoughts about it, if the eradication is still failed after multiple cause of, or at least one or two cause of generic treatment, you may need to consider about usage the branded therapy. Okay. Okay, um, one last question. Uh, how do you manage patients with side effects of triple therapy? Um, Okay, this is quite a tricky question actually. So most of the time, um, I will, in my clinical practice, actually, I routinely see the patient a month after treatment. I'll see what their predominant symptom is. Um, most of the time, um, because of the creatromycin component of the treatment, we do notice that patient has more bloatedness. Um, some of these patients, I may just ask them to use probiotic, and some of them, I either use uh, methylspasmium or ganaton as an add-on component. Okay, uh, that's all the questions that we have today. Uh, again, from CBSKL, thank you very much, Dr. Ganes and Dr. New, for taking the time to present to us today. Uh, to all our attendees attending, um, thank you for spending the weekend with us. Uh, just a gentle reminder, we do have a similar webinar next week, same time, but this time focusing on cardiology. Um, Dr. Ganes and Dr. New, if you have nothing else to add, we will leave the session. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.